Well, I want to take a moment tonight and uh, speak to us about some of the learnings uh, that we have had in this last season in church and where that leads us to in terms of some of the foundations and the vision that we have moving forward, which I'm going to try not to get to. Everything within me is going to try and contain myself on the vision front and leave that for Sunday week. So not this Sunday, but the Sunday after. Um, but if I get a little bit too excited and let a little bit of slip, don't, don't tell anyone, all right? That's the, that's the deal tonight. So we're going to start here talking about some of our, uh, our learnings. And it's, it's been a profound journey for us all as a community and uh, certainly for Danny and I uh, landing here just over a year ago and all that we feel like we have learned in that time. Um, I, I often have people ask me um, what this last year has been like for us uh, and I tell people that our church here is full of incredible people that I couldn't be more privileged and feel honored to do life with. And uh, so that's been really exciting. Um, and I also tell people that uh, we've learned and grown a whole lot as a result. And I'm so grateful because uh, um, hopefully Danny would say the same thing, but I feel like I'm a better husband. I feel like I'm a better pastor. I feel like I'm a better uh, dad. I feel like I'm a better leader. Um, and it's one of those things, it's like the more you know, the more you know that you don't know. And so growth has been like a two-edged sword. On the one hand, um, I'm really excited to have felt like I've been growing. On the other hand, it's made me really aware of how much more I need to keep growing. So uh, I feel like in many ways I know less than I have ever known in my life. But we're growing, and that's the amazing thing. And so I wanted to talk to us about learnings and growth tonight. Um, uh, I'd, I'd been through a particularly difficult season at, uh, at one stage in life and ministry, and it had, uh, it had extended for a period of, of a couple of years. And I, uh, I, have, I have some people in my life who I trust well enough that they know me, they love me, they know my heart, um, that when I meet with them, um, they're like mentors in my life, and I know that I can be brutally honest about how I'm feeling, and they'll either you know, put me in my place or bring some correction or uh, bring some challenge and some discipline, and I know what I'm in for, and I purposely open myself up for it because I'm ready for them to correct me. And I was sitting down with a mentor like that once, and uh, after a particularly trying season uh, that I was uh, complaining about um, in a very ungodly fashion, <laughs> and uh, he, he asked me what I'd learned from that season. Uh, everything about me in that season was wanting to put all of the you know, all of the focus and all the blame on other people and other situations. And, and he asked me, well, what have you learned? Uh, and I said nothing because I was feeling in that kind of stubborn mood that I didn't want to see the bright side of anything. There's no silver lining here. Don't try that trick on me. And uh, so I told him, I haven't, I haven't learned anything. And he said to me, uh, if you don't learn the lesson, you'll be destined to repeat the season until you do. And so I pretty quickly came up with five or six lessons that I'd learned because uh, I just didn't want to repeat that season. It had been a, a terribly trying one. And I want the same thing for our church. I want us to come out of this season and every season having learned some really valuable lessons. I pray that learning will be a part of our culture, that we're constantly learning and refining and adjusting and getting better and taking steps forward. I pray that learning would be part of that. Now, I've been so inspired by uh, the people of our church here that have stood by one another through thick and thin and have a passion to continue to see us as a church move forward together. It says of Jesus that he grew in wisdom and stature and favor. And I know he was born as a baby. In many ways, he had to grow in stature, but he grew in wisdom. He grew in favor. And if Jesus could be growing, then how much more we, his body now, can be growing? I pray that we would be growing. Owen Eastwood, in his book on belonging, spoke about ancient hunter-gatherer civilizations and he said an even worse outcome than coming back to the village without food 
is not to understand why. They had to be constantly learning. Learning from our shortcomings and our failures, it can help us get better. It can help us be even get to the point where one day we're grateful for some of the hardships that God brought us through because of how we have grown, because of how we've moved forward, because of what God has done in our hearts as we get better. Now, we're not going to be perfect. Not, not this year anyway, maybe next year, but we're not going to get to perfection, but we do have the opportunity to get better. There's a little saying that is progress over perfection. And I'm praying that we would be progressing as a community, but I also pray in our life, thank you for that applause, oh, I'm also praying that in our lives, we would be progressing, we would be moving forward. So, in the interest of not repeating the last season, anybody say amen? amen. And moving forward in strength. <laughs> Um, Here are some of the primary learnings that we are taking away from this season. I know we've touched on some of these in the past. We've touched on some things when it's come to Heart and Soul Nights in the past. Um, But these are some of the lasting ones that have stayed with us. And uh, and I'm going to take time over this next season to... I've been writing, for those of you that like reading uh, stuff, uh, I've been writing a series of letters to our church. Um, And so we're going to be releasing that over these next few weeks. And I'm hoping to flesh out some of these concepts as well as start to flesh out the vision and the foundations that we're believing to build on moving forward. I've also started to interview a whole lot of uh, pastors and leaders from within and outside of our church and allow some of those people to speak back into our community, what they see, what they feel like we've learned, what they believe is on our church and our church moving forward. And I know you're going to be incredibly encouraged. Uh, It's been inspiring to be a part of those conversations. So I hope they're as encouraging for you. So first thing is this. Number one, we are in an adaptive leadership moment. We are in an adaptive leadership moment. Uh, Todd Bolsinger, in his book, Canoeing the Mountains, he retells the story of Lewis and Clark. Um, Embarrassingly for me, until I read his book, and predominantly because I grew up in Australia, um, I thought that Lewis and Clark was the same as Lois and Clark, and just associated it with with Superman. Um, Turns out that uh, this was a good history lesson for me, um, that Lewis and Clark were explorers, and... uh, and it turns out for literally centuries, uh, literally for centuries, at least four different countries had been searching for the Northwest Passage, a waterway connecting the two oceans, connecting the Mississippi River with the Pacific Ocean. And Lewis and Clark had led what was called the Corps of Discovery, and they were canoeing up the Missouri uh, right up to its source. And they got to the source, and they drank of its cool, refreshing water, and they climbed up the last part, the crest of the hill. At the top of that hill, they were expecting to see that there would be a new waterway that would begin, a new source that would start. And this canoes that they'd been taking upriver all of this time, something like 15 months worth of canoeing upriver, now they were going to place them in a tributary that was going to run down the hill and take them all the way to the ocean. They'd done the hard part, they thought. And now the easy part was ahead. And they get to the top of this peak, And they discover that on the other side, instead of seeing a smooth descent down into the ocean, they see hill after mountain, after jagged outcropping, after snow-covered peaks. They see the Rocky Mountains stretching as far as the eye can see. And in that moment, they realize there is no Northwest Passage. Todd Bolsinger writes this about what they discovered. At that moment, Meriwether Lewis, everything Meriwether Lewis assumed about his journey changed. He was planning on exploring the new world by boat. He was a river explorer. 
They planned on rowing and they thought the hardest part was behind them. But in truth, everything that they had accomplished was only a prelude to what was in front of them. Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery were about to go off the map and into uncharted territory. They would have to change plans, give up expectations, even reframe their entire mission. What lay before them was nothing like what was behind them. There were no experts, no maps, no best practices, and no sure guides who could lead them safely and successfully. The story of the core of discovery is the driving metaphor for our present moment in history. In every field, in every business, every organization, leaders are rapidly coming to the awareness that the world in front of us is radically different from everything behind us. Like Meriwether Lewis sitting on the crest of the Lemhi Pass looking at a landscape he couldn't have imagined. All that we have assumed about leading Christian organizations, all that we have been trained for is out of date. We have left the map. We are in uncharted territory. And it is different than we expected. We are experienced river rafters who must learn to be mountaineers. We are in an adaptive leadership moment. What lays before us has not been traversed before. There is wisdom to be gained, absolutely. There are learnings that we can take into our future, absolutely. But we are going to be reliant on discernment and the work of the Spirit like never before as we chart a course forward for the church. As we reflected on this idea recently, Carla, actually, one of our team, responded by saying, what a privilege that God would have chosen us to be alive at this time. And I believe it. I believe we are born for this and we are born for such a time as this. And what we need is a spirit of adventure and courage. We need a spirit of adventure and courage. When Danny and I, four years ago, sat down to think about what the next decade of our lives would look like, uh, we, 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 we found that what we imagined was dominated by this word adventure. Now, we thought that adventure was going to look very different to what it looks like now. We imagined that adventure was going to take place perhaps in Asia and that part of the world, and we uh, feel like we're a long way from that adventure, but it is adventure nonetheless. I find that continually we need to choose a spirit of adventure. God knew the adventure we were going to be on. And he has been preparing us as a community, us as leaders, us as volunteers for this moment in time because he knew the adventure that we would be on with him. When the Israelites stood on the edge of their new adventure, when they stood on the edge of the promised land, they were moving from running from the Egyptian army to conquering cities, from wandering in the desert to establishing homes, from the miraculous provision of food to planting and harvesting crops. It was a whole new way of living ahead of them. It was going to be a complete paradigm shift. And God told Joshua at that time, in Joshua 1, verses 6 to 9, He told Joshua three times, be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Be strong and courageous. And I believe what God was saying to Joshua then, He would say to us now, be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. It's easy in this season to be overcome 
with fear and anxiety and everything else that is coming our way in society. But I believe if we would hear the voice of the Lord as we stand on the precipice of our own adaptive leadership moment, of our own stepping into a hitherto unseen promised land and future that God has for us, as we leave behind some canoes and begin to be mountaineers, that we could hear the voice of the Lord saying that same thing, be strong and very courageous. Kwabana, an incredible part of our church in New York, was speaking at church recently and he was talking about the key messages that he had discerned from every ministry he'd sat under from the time that he was a boy. And he talked about some of the key messages that he'd received from different church environments. And when he started talking about our church, what he had distilled as the key message, the key takeaway, the key thing that had impacted his life from being a part of our church all these years, he said it was courage. Courage to step out in faith. Courage to step out and take the church to the world in a way that it hadn't maybe experienced it before. Courage to step into key cities of influence that sometimes were known as a graveyard for churches, but believed that God could do something fresh and new in those very places to see His Spirit poured out and people come to know Him. Courage. I so resonated with what Quab was saying. We are in an adaptive leadership moment and we need to choose a spirit of adventure and lay a hold of that adventure with courage. I pray that together as a church we might move forward into what God has for us with that kind of courage. The second thing is this, ownership. We need ownership. In, uh, in Todd's book, once again, Canoeing the Mountains, and then again in Steve Cusser's book, Managing Leadership Anxiety, in Mark Sayer's book, which I haven't read, thank you very much, Kane. In Mark Sayer's book, which I haven't read, called A Non-Anxious Presence, um, they all draw in significant part from the work of an author named Edwin Friedman. His book, Failure of Nerve, talks about a chronic anxiety in American society that has seeped into every part of the society, from families to communities to the nation as a whole. I'd assumed initially that he was talking about the effects of technology and social media and a pandemic and everything that we have faced in terms of uncertainty. I thought that was the anxiety that he was referring to. But as I began to read his work, I realized he was writing in the 1990s. I mean, to me, that still sounds like a really recent time, but there's probably many people in this room that weren't born yet. And that certainly ages me as well as the white in my beard. But He was writing about a chronic anxiety that he was seeing in the 90s that now we all look around and see, well, of course, yeah, that's there and and, and it's because of this and it's because of that, but maybe it's more deeply rooted than that. Friedman is writing like a prophet and saying this is the problem that we're facing and this is the challenge that it poses for leadership. And he starts to write about that in a really inspiring way. He was already seeing then as his, in his work as a rabbi, as an organizational consultant, as a family therapist who also worked with the White House during the Johnson administration. He was seeing what we think is a relatively new state for our country to be in. And what he identifies is the need in any community for leaders to be willing to take responsibility. He outlines how in therapy he would stop working with an entire family. Anytime he had a family come and see him and they were trying to resolve something as a family together, uh, he would tell them, he would tell all of them to not bother coming anymore. And he would find the one person in that family that was willing to take responsibility, 
Not just point the finger at everybody else. He'd find the one person that was willing to take responsibility. It didn't even matter who it was. It didn't matter. It didn't need to be a, the mother or the father. It didn't need to be the, 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 the head figure in the family. It just needed to be someone who was willing to take responsibility. And then he would work with that one person alone. And what he said he found is that the entire family would end up in therapy by virtue of that one person being transformed because they were willing to take responsibility. The very first thing that humankind does when it makes its very first mistake in the book of Genesis is to start to find someone else to blame. <laughs> God comes to Adam. Adam says, it wasn't me, it was her. <laughs> she says, it wasn't me, it was the snake. And the snake was left without a leg to stand on. That's, that's a very, very old preacher's joke. I just, I couldn't resist. It's, it's, it's a terrible combination of being a dad and having grown up in church and just, yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize in advance. But we find that same temptation in our own lives. Um, who can I find to blame? Who can I find to put the focus on for the challenge that we're in? I'm not talking about excusing people's behavior or a, or a lack of accountability at all. I am talking about how as a church we have the opportunity to look deeper than individual behaviors and the opportunity to look at cultures that have developed in certain areas that have allowed unhelpful, unhealthy, sometimes harmful behavior to take place. Ownership looks like taking responsibility for transforming our culture and not just finding individuals to try and pin the blame on. Notably for us in the East Coast, I believe we need to value humility in our leadership. That to be great means to be the servant of all. It's no wonder that Jesus, the most often, the thing that he addressed the most often with his disciples over and over and over again, he's saying, hey, guys, if you want to be great, you've got to be a servant. If you want to be a big deal in the kingdom, you've got to be like the head servant. In fact, his very last night with his disciples, this is such a big deal for him that he enacts or embodies a physical representation of what it means to serve others as a leader. And he washes all of their feet. And we need to look at what it means to build the kind of habits and practices that reflect being a shepherd over the ways in which the world sees being a leader. And I still believe in what it means for us to be leaders, but let us be leaders as defined by the gospel and the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, and not leaders as defined by the ways of the world. Some of the practices that we continue to learn is in, uh, in a coursework that I'll talk about in a moment called EHR and EHS are a fantastic starting point for some of these practices. Learning to know what's going on in us so that we can lead better is, is crucial to how we interact with others as leaders. Without doing the hard work of, of discerning our own hearts, it becomes all too easy to react and to lead out of all of our insecurities, out of our own turmoil, out of the bad pizza we had last night. It becomes all too easy to act out of our past. And when we develop habits of taking the time instead to allow God to search our hearts and grow in our self-awareness of the things that drive us, we can become more Christ-like as leaders and as followers of Christ. We need to look at what it means to develop and, and input into pastors and leaders, the accountability and the oversight and the time it takes for that to happen. There is much else that needs to be done, and some of that we'll reflect on tonight. But I don't just want to talk about what this looks like for our context as a church community. I also want to encourage us around what it means for our lives personally. 
We're in a context in broader society of a chronic anxiety. That is to say, not an anxiety that's specifically about something like the pandemic or about anything specifically, but it's chronic. It, it exists and pervades all of our society and in all of our lives, the interpersonal parts of our lives, our family and community dynamics. It can, it can become second nature to want to shift the focus somewhere else and it's somebody else's problem and somebody else that needs to change. However, we have an opportunity for what Friedman describes as maturity. And he describes it as this, the willingness to take responsibility for one's own emotional being and destiny. In some environments like Abusive relationships, this this doesn't look like bending over backwards to somehow please a, an abusive partner. It might instead look like getting the right support and making empowered choices regarding boundaries that need to be established. But for most of us, most of the time, it often looks like knowing ourselves well enough to understand where our actions and reactions are stemming from and having the habits and practices in place to help us bring those before the Lord and allow Him to transform us bit by bit. There are two of those initial courses that we're going to engage in as a church, emotionally healthy relationships and emotionally healthy spirituality. And they're going to be incredibly helpful in developing some of these skills and practices. The Jesuits had a regimen called the Examine. And they used to do that twice a day, spending 15 minutes at a time to reflect on themselves, reflect on the moments in their life, on what was drawing them closer to God's plan and purpose for their life, and what was drawing them closer and further away from God's plan and purpose, closer to what the enemy of human nature or the devil would have for their life who comes to steal and kill and destroy. And it's amazing that these kinds of practices facilitate the kind of self-awareness that we now hear talked about when it comes to leadership all the time but have existed in the church for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And in order for us to move forward as mountaineers into all that God has for us, there are some things from the past that we need to lay a hold of in a fresh way. And I pray that we're going to be able to do that. Number three, a differentiated presence. A differentiated presence. I know that it sounds awkward, maybe even a little bit clunky, the wording, maybe a little bit unfamiliar, but one of the key ideas that Friedman is talking about is that we need to be able to live differentiated from those around us. Steve Cuss captures this well, and in his book, Managing Leadership Anxiety, he says this, differentiation is the ability to be fully yourself while being fully connected to people. It is gaining clarity on where I end and the other begins. The opposites on either side of differentiation are enmeshment and detachment. An enmeshed leader is unable to hold any space between themselves and the other. If the other is struggling, the enmeshed leader gets pulled into it. The detached leader holds too much space between themselves and the other. There is so much space that the leader does not care for the, un the other. The, un the enmeshed leader struggles with codependency but calls it empathy. The detached leader struggles with indifference and thinks it is healthy. Now, I'm praying that we might learn what it is to be a differentiated presence or what Mark Sayers calls a non-anxious presence in the world. Steve's not saying that empathy is wrong. And uh, certainly, I don't think any of us would put our faith in that idea. But true empathy can only exist when one stays in a place where they are able to help and doesn't become crippled by the weight of the stress and worry and anxiety felt by someone else. Steve, who for many years worked as a chaplain in a hospital, was all too familiar with the idea that anxiety could be caught. He tells stories of being thrown into situations where loved ones had passed away and he's feeling the weight of the anxiety of the family and feeling the weight of the anxiety of the nurse who needs that hospital bed cleared out so that they can bring in a new patient. And he's carrying these anxieties that are coming at him from all different environments. And his thesis is that during COVID, we all caught anxiety from each other. 
What is encouraging, however, is that anxiety is not the only thing that's contagious. Hope is contagious. Joy is contagious. Peace is contagious. The stuff of the fruit of the Spirit is contagious. And if we can exist a differentiated presence in the lives of people, then all of a sudden we can become a source of some kingdom contagion in the lives of those around us. One of the tricks that Steve talks about is being able to identify where that anxiety is sitting. He talks about being able to walk into a room and recognize where the anxiety is coming from. And he says that from his experience, anxiety sits in one of four places. There's the anxiety that's within us. And that's the anxiety we can have. There's a lot of practices we can put in place and do something about. Then there's the anxiety that sits in somebody else. And for a large part, we actually can't do anything about that, even though everything within us wants to strive and work emotionally to try and shift that for somebody else. Then there's the anxiety that sits between us and the anxiety that sits between others. And he says that starting to identify where the anxiety is in a room makes it easier for us to recognize what's our responsibility and what sits with someone else empowering us to be a differentiated presence everywhere that we go. I pray that we would be a source of kingdom come in every environment we find ourselves in. That we would learn what it's like to build some of the practices and focus that could help us to step into all that God has for us as part of his kingdom, as part of his body. I pray that the effect of that would be seen in our church community. I pray that when people step out of the week that they've had and come into our environment, it wouldn't just be incredible worship. It wouldn't just be an inspiring word. It wouldn't just be a move of the Holy Spirit, but there'd be something about a community that is full of hope. There'd be something about a community that it's full of faith. There'd be something about a community that is experiencing the peace and the presence of God that starts to be felt and caught by others as they step into church any given Sunday. The fourth thing is this, discipleship. Discipleship. We need to engage in a broader understanding of what it means to make disciples. In our church, we've had a very relational view of discipleship, and it is a key component of what it means to be discipled. We are formed in and by community. The relational aspect is super important, but there are other pieces that are needed to help us grow. In some environments, discipleship becomes all about how much you know. And so we put together a bunch of programs because if you know more, if you know more about the Bible, if you know more about how to read it, if you know more about a Christian worldview, then you're growing as a disciple. And again, knowledge is a part of it, but it isn't all of it. The third component and the one that I think we have sometimes neglected the most is to do with worship practices. What are the ways in which we are forming habits of worship? What are the ways in which we are engaging with practices of worship? James K.A. Smith, he's a Christian uh, author and scholar and uh, philosophical theologian, I guess. And uh, he writes using usually a whole lot of words that I need a dictionary next to me just to try and figure out what it all means. But I didn't want to read you this quote, so if it's going a little bit over your head, don't worry, it went over mine as well. Um, If a Christian education is going to be holistic and formative, it needs to attend to much more than the intellect, which is why I emphasize that there is a unique understanding that is carried in Christian practices, particularly the practices of Christian worship. It is in such practices that our love is trained, disciplined, shaped, and formed. What he's suggesting is that it is the practices we engage in that help form who we are in ways that affect 
how we respond and react and embody God's kingdom in the world he has called us to live in. We need more than knowledge. We need a second nature response that is kingdom oriented and becoming more like Christ. I know this innately just in my relationships with people, my relationship with my wife. I know there are certain practices that if I engage in those practices, if I engage in those actual real things, more than just knowing about her, more than just reading a book about her, all of those things can be helpful. But there are practices in place in our life that if we are enacting those regularly, it's going to draw our affection towards one another and knit us together and if there are practices that I fail to engage with we're going to drift and James Smith is saying it's those practices not just knowledge and on top of community which is vital those practices are necessary N.T. Wright calls this virtue and writes in his book, After You Believe, virtue is what happens when wise and courageous choices have become second nature. Not first nature, as though they happen naturally, rather a second order level of naturalness. Like an acquired taste, such choices and actions, which started off being practiced with difficulty, ended up being, yes, second nature nature this is what we want taking place in our discipleship it's the engagement in practices that develop us as disciples and that's often missing in in our context and in our broader western context to that end we have had the privilege of being involved with the work of pete and jerry scazzaro pete pastored in queens for decades and during this time he developed a coursework that draws on some incredibly rich practices from a broad cross-section of christian history there are two primary courses which we're going to be incorporating into our church life the first is called emotionally healthy relationships and the second is emotionally healthy spirituality one focuses in on how on the practices that enable us to grow in the love and connection we have with other people and the other focuses on the practices we can put in place to grow in our love and affection for god and both of these things are vital we're running our first uh, larger scale course right now. And towards the end of this year, we're going to also take a team through the second course. And next year, we're looking to offer both of those more broadly throughout our church. Together, they're a great introduction to some of those practices, some of those worship practices. One of the challenges for us as a society is that during the pandemic, for many of us, whose only worship practice was coming to church, we ended up without any practices during the course of the pandemic. And I'm praying, I don't know what's coming next. I, and I, I pray there's no kind of pandemic in our future. But I pray that we'd be, we'd be developed as disciples in such a way that regardless of what the season is that comes our way, there are worship practices that we know we can engage in to continue to draw our affections towards God and all that he has for our life. Number five, local advice, support, and accountability. During this last season, the inadequacy of our previous global structure in our church to be able to support and empower local congregations, particularly in the midst of crisis, became very apparently insufficient. There's a huge need to be empowering some of the expertise in our local congregations to play critical roles in advice and support and accountability. To that end, in April this year, and upon the nomination of some of our pastors, we prayerfully formed an interim East Coast advisory that has been 
meeting weekly initially to be able to input into the strategic decisions and the key focuses that we're developing as a church. Um, I think we've got a picture of some of the people who are involved in that advisory and some good people there have been involved. There are others we are going to be inviting into that advisory as well. And we're believing that together with our pastoral team, um, that advisory is going to provide a great bedrock of advice and support of accountability. Um, the team as it stands, if we can bring that up on the screens. Thank you, Jeffrey. It uh, looks a bit like I successfully spilled. No, no, no. It's entirely my bad. I'm going to take total responsibility for what happened to the water just then. No, let me take responsibility. No, no, please. No, it's my fault. <laughs> um, so, uh, Tulu is leading our church in New York. Destiny Legend is leading our church in Boston. And we're in the process at the moment, actually, of, uh, of interview interviewing for the Boston campus role. Destiny is going to be continuing with our church in Boston and certainly has the leadership and the capacity and the skills to be continuing to do phenomenal things as a minister and uh, really excited about all that is ahead for her. And we're looking had some incredible options to be leading our church in Boston. And Kane is leading here, right here in New Jersey and has a very loud cheer squad right here, which is fantastic. Megan Ulri is leading church online, which is really cool. And uh, Tulu is also helping with our central support. And uh, then you see Carla there in, doing Generations in New Jersey. Deb, who is continuing to lead creative events and teams pastor and pretty much everything, uh, does everything. And Lulu is the Generations pastor in New York as well as uh, doing a phenomenal job with a lot of the things on, uh, on social and putting things together for us. So we appreciate uh, all the team. Keith Newton in finance, um, who is an absolute legend as well. And once upon a time ran a little cupcake shop too. So if you need something baked for you, he's the guy to... He doesn't bake the numbers, just good cupcakes. Just, I know, it's terrible, right? But I apologized in advance for... So, we're believing that as we build out an advisory and have local support and lean on the wisdom that is here in the soil of our church, that God is going to speak through us as a community. And that we're going to arrive upon the God things as we start to step forward in this season that we wholeheartedly believe is a season of breakthrough. That advisory has been meeting weekly and it's helped challenge ideas that they believe might not be aligned with what is needed at this moment in our church. It has helped, they've helped add capacity. They've helped bring support to many of the challenges and opportunities that we are facing. I'm personally very grateful for their input and their time. And moving forward, we're going to uh, have a draft. Role. We've got already a draft role description for what that group's going to be working towards, which will finalize and begin a process of interviewing all of them with, a, with some external pastors and professionals that have uh, given of their time to help uh, interview for those kinds of roles, which is really exciting. And as our global processes get rolled out for that type of team, we're going to be looking to adopt those and um, looking to, at the nomination processes and the length of time that people might sit in a position and all of those kinds of things. We've also partnered with an external HR advisor and an outside pastoral council to be able to really help us with hiring practices, exit interviews to help us learn, discipline and restoration practices. And this has all helped us approach each situation with the, with the due diligence and the understanding that uh, come with individual complexities. Uh, as well as that, it's been a joy for me personally to be able to connect with a number of pastors outside of our church. Uh, recently had the privilege of being with the team at Gateway and being inputted 
into by Pastor Robert Morris and some of his team, which has been phenomenal. We've had the opportunity to spend time with uh, Pete Scazzaro and pick his brain on things, to spend time with Chris Vallotton and uh, all that his wisdom in the area of church building and the prophetic has to contribute into our world. Uh, a Jesuit father by the name of Father George, who have been spending time with and learning. And it's been an absolute joy to learn from a broad range of Christian traditions and denominations so we can help distill down what's going to be helpful for us here on the Northeast to really see the church move forward into this next season. One of the really exciting things has been interviewing a number of these people, uh, and I know that you're going to be really thrilled to hear from some of them as they start to encourage us around all that God has ahead for us. Number six, volunteering. A few years ago, I, uh, I sat down with a great young couple, and uh, we, we talked about uh, their engagement. They'd just gotten engaged, and they were sitting with me to ask me, there's a huge little, well, not a, I thought it was going to be a huge woo, but it was just a little woo for <laughs> getting engaged. Um, a little, little bigger woo, yeah. It's never, it's never like married people that are going, woo, you got engaged. It's, I don't know what that says. I mean, it doesn't say anything, but we won't read into it. <laughs> um, she'd, she'd been a part of our youth ministry, and, uh, and they were sitting down with me to ask uh, if I'd marry them. And, uh, and before we got into that part of the conversation, uh, the, the, the fiancé, uh, who I didn't know as well, he said to me, uh, before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you because um, they'd done the same course together. And he said uh, that of our whole course, our whole year, um, there are things that my fiancé is capable of when it comes to working with people, when it comes to facilitating groups, when it comes to leadership, that no one else in the whole course is capable of the same way that she is. And I know that it's only in her because of the experience of being involved in the church and serving and volunteering as a leader in the church community. And I just wanted to say thank you. And it was amazing because in my time in our church, I've heard that story over and over and over again. That the skills that people have learned, that the community that they've been able to grow in, that what they've been able to discern about the, their own gifts and the talents on their life, what's been developed in people as, in terms of leadership has meant that what they've stepped into in the marketplace and in their families and in other areas of their life has flourished and moved forward. Our heart for the people of our church is that by being involved, your life would be blessed as a result. And that what you learn and pick up in this environment would be a blessing everywhere you go. Our prayer that for those who sow in their time and sweat and tears is that this community will enrich your soul, that this culture will make it an easy environment to grow in, that the servant-hearted leadership skills and, will, will, and growth in your own confidence it's going to serve people well in every area of life you step into. On top of that, our hope is that together we might be able to take the kingdom forward in our generation. That we might be able to leave an incredible legacy for the one to come. And while this has been the experience of, of, of many people in our church and many in leadership and volunteer teams in our church that I've met from all around the globe, we also know that there are people who have felt overused in our environment, have felt like they haven't been adequately inputted into or cared for. And maybe all of us at times have felt like we've also experienced that side of things. The temptation when we address how to change in this area and move forward is to jump from one extreme to the other. We move from one extreme of everyone is to be all in and at everything all of the time. And we move to the other extreme of let's create a whole bunch of rules so that people aren't allowed to do this and you're not allowed to do that. And this is the only the amount that you're able to bring to the table. This is only the amount of hours you're allowed to serve. And while I understand and, and absolutely affirm the need for good boundaries, what I believe is going to be better is equipping people with the kind of wisdom and the kind of 
practices that are going to empower them to make good decisions about their own involvement and create a culture in our leadership that is holistic and supportive of those decisions that people make. This year we put our entire church through our entire church staff through the first subject of a, a course in well-being studies. Uh, for some of us, it was a rude shock because we hadn't done any actual study like that in a very long time, and this was postgraduate level study, but I'm pleased to say we all completed the first subject. Um, and the goal is to help us as leaders be aware of some of the best practice that's taking place as people are learning about what it means to put holistic health into place in people's lives so that everything from our leading to our preaching can be informed by the intersection between what we're discovering in terms of best practice in the world through to what we know is best practice from the Bible. And when we bring those two things together, there's a powerful opportunity for us to establish practices in our church and culture in our church that's going to result in well-being for people. I pray that as we continue to grow in that area, there would be practices that would be evident in our church around things like rest, and the Sabbath, and developing a, a rule of life in order to live by, to see us achieve those things we believe God has placed on our life in such a way that we, we don't just inherit the world but, and sacrifice our soul, but we flourish in our souls. Again, EHS is an incredible course that sets some of the fundamentals for those things, and we're also putting together some outlines for each and every role in our church to showcase some of the ways it's possible to contribute in sustainable ways, but also in key places of leadership. We've seen over the years that many people in our church have incredible capacity and desire and heart to do meaningful work in building the lives of other people through the church. And we want to make it possible for people to contribute in meaningful ways without having to give up the things that they're called to during the week, but be able to contribute in ways that are going to see people blessed and move forward. And over our time in church, we've, we've seen many people do that over the years in really successful ways, volunteer and pastor and lead services and congregations of hundreds, if not thousands of people, oversee connect groups and groups of people in ways where if I just have a few hours to give every week, how do I lead a community in such a way as is sustainable for me, but also does something meaningful for others? And we're going to continue to work at developing those models and making it clear how people can get involved and serve at a, and in a way that's fulfilling and in a way that makes a meaningful contribution. Yeah. Number seven, and finally, is this. And it got shorter the longer I went, so I apologize. Some of you are grateful for that. Some of you, not so much. The seventh and the final thing is generosity. Um, in the time I had to be at Gateway, I was struck by the generosity of that church. Um, while I was there with them, they made a really generous contribution into our own church, another church, someone else's church. They're, they're there in, in Texas, and they're sowing into our church in the Northeast. And I had this strange thing that I hadn't felt before. Um, it was like there was some Northeast pride that rose up in me, some New York pride that rose up in me. And I was grateful for that contribution. I know that over the years, many ministries and churches have contributed to, to allow us, enable us to be who we are. And I was, I was grateful for all of that. But I noticed this thing rise up that I hadn't noticed before. And it was this sense of kind of pride. Now, I'm praying that it's a godly pride. But there was a sense of pride that was almost like, well, that's, that's great for Texas. I, I, I love these guys. They're phenomenal what they're doing. But something about their generous stance had rubbed off on me. And I was like, that's, that's great for Texas. But, but this is the Northeast. Like, this is New York. This is New Jersey. This is Boston. I mean, if anyone's going to be generous, 
I mean, I love Texas. I mean, I love the, the generosity and the outlook. But if anyone's going to be generous in seeing the kingdom move forward, not just where we are, but in other parts of the world, I'm praying it's going to be here. This is the place where generosity is going to stem from. This is the place where all of that is going to be unearthed. And for me, that, that's so connected even to my own history. When I look back through my family tree and looked at some of the pictures and, and bits of paper and things that we had going back from generations... There's a great, great, great grandfather of mine who studied at Bible college and became a pastor. And it turned out he was sponsored to go to Bible college and become a pastor in Sri Lanka because out of Boston, there was an organization that was sponsoring people to go and do that so that they could plant churches and take the gospel forward. In my own spiritual legacy is a legacy of generosity that stems out of the Northeast and has reached out into other parts of the world. And I'm believing... That our church moving into the future isn't just going to be a recipient of generosity, but is going to be a place from which it stems into the lives of others, into the mission work in other parts of the world where people are unreached with the gospel and don't have access to churches. I'm believing that God is going to stir the hearts of our people here, that there's going to be blessing on the people in our church, and that when that comes, we're going to pay attention to what God is saying he wants us to do with that i'm praying he's going to raise up a spirit of generosity in our church henry nowen says this about generosity god's kingdom is the place of abundance where every generous act overflows its original bounds and becomes part of the unbounded grace of god which is at work in the world and I can't think of anything better to do with all that God has entrusted me with than allow it to become part of the unbounded grace of God at work in the world. And allow it to be something and part of something that is going to far outlive us. I'm praying that these learnings are going to help us to move forward into all that God has for us and shift some paradigms and create something new and do something beautiful in the northeast of America that might be a light for what God is wanting to do across the world in these times. We are in an adaptive leadership moment. And while it's tempting to adopt a whole lot of different stances to the challenges faced by the mountains ahead, I pray that we would understand that God knew the times and the days that we would live in. And he has put us here for such a time as this. And so let us lay a hold of a spirit of adventure and some strength and some courage, and let's take the mountain that God has for us. In Jesus' name, amen, and amen, and amen. I'm going to pray, and then uh, at every location we're going to go local again for a moment, maybe worship for a moment, I think is the thing we're going to do right now. Um, so let's pray together as the teams come up, and then we're going to spend a moment in worship, re reorienting ourselves and recommitting ourselves to everything that God is calling us to do, to choosing a spirit of adventure and courage and strength. Father, I thank you that you are here that you are with us, that you are in our midst. And Lord, we pray, may you fill us with strength. May you grace us with courage. May you help us to choose a spirit of adventure about these days that we're in. May we understand how to live in such a way that your kingdom through us might be contagious for those around us. Lord, we pray for our friends. We pray for our family. We pray for those in our world. 
consumed by the ways of the world and the thinking so prevalent in this season. Lord, help us not just to speak to them about you, but help us to embody your hopeful, joyful, peaceful reality in such a way that they are drawn to your light in us. Change us, Lord, to become more like you. Let us serve others like you came and served us. And Lord, may all you have given us flow back into being a part of your unbounded grace that is at work in the world. Lord, it is all yours. Lord, we are all yours. We commit ourselves to you afresh. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen.